So um, the zeros of a non-zero analytic functions are isolated. Another way of expressing this is to say that if the set of zeros of an analytic function has a limit point in the set, in the domain, the function has to be identically zero. Right? So if the function is a non-zero function, it's not identically zero, it's not the zero function, then the set of zeros is an isolated set of points, so has no limit points. So if you state it the other way, if the zero set has a limit point in the domain, then the function has to be identically zero. Okay. So this is just going to be a restatement of this, right? F is analytic in a connected domain and in a connected domain omega and the set of zeros of F has limit point in omega then f is a zero function. So this shows that an analytic function is determined by its values on a set having a limit point. Determined on the whole domain by the values on a small set. Right? So this is absolutely an amazing thing. If you look at what happens in the real case, so for example, if you say uh, take the unit disk for example, or the whole plane, if you have a function, an analytic function, which has zeros at all points, one by n, one, one by two, one by three, one by four, etc then the conclusion is that the function is identically zero. Right? If, if an analytic function on, on the plane, let's say, vanishes at all 1 by n, then it has to be the zero function. Right? This is astonishing. So there's a rigid structure of analyticity. So, in other words, the, val the, the function on the whole plane is completely determined by its values on this set, 1 by n. So, this can be again rephrased as the following theorem. If you have two analytic functions, is it okay? okay. So omega is connected. and f and g are analytic omega
suppose f same as g for all z in e where e is in a subset of omega and e has a limit point in omega then f is equal to g on omega. Two analytic functions agree on a set with a limit point, they agree everywhere. So, so just apply this to the function f minus g, right? f minus g is an analytic function, it vanishes at all points on a set with a limit point, so it's zero. So let us uh, make some real analysis noises now, okay? How things are totally different in the real case, real variable case. So we had uh, already looked at uh, an example in the real case, f of t is for minus one over t, t greater than zero. Uh, remember? This is an example of a, an infinitely differentiable function which has no power series expansion around zero because all the derivatives at zero are zero. See, in the case of analytic functions, we saw that if all the derivatives are zero at some point, hmm, it must be a constant, right, in the domain. So nothing like that is true for differentiable, real differentiable function, real infinitely differentiable functions even. See, in fact, in, in, in uh, real analysis, you, you can even have um, smooth functions, infinitely differentiable functions which vanish outside a compact set, a large set, right? So these are in fact very important in analysis, in various parts of analysis. Uh, so what is called uh, can I write Rn also, but for simplicity, let us look at R. C infinity means infinity differentiable function. Ck is k times continuously differentiable. So C infinity is infinitely differentiable functions. That C below, the subscript C, stands for compact support. I mean, vanishing outside a compact set. this function vanishing outside a compact set, you say that it has compact support. <coughs> support of a function is the closure of the set of points where the function is zero. So that is compact here. <laughs> You can actually easily construct such functions, even starting from this function, for example. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but um, 
Let me draw some pictures at least. Okay. Suppose you take an interval on R, right? Can you tell me how to get the start to it? A continuous function which vanishes outside this interval function which is continuous on the whole rail line, but vanishes outside this interval. Draw pictures, that's enough. Just draw a, a continuous curve vanishing outside that interval. That's all. Mm -hmm. Show me some picture. What you want is uh, zero outside this. So the graph is zero here and zero here. So inside it can be anything, but it has to start with this and end with this to get continuity. That's all. So you draw anything you like in between. Okay. So for example, right? A triangular function if you like. Do something more if you want to. Take a smaller interval. You can even get a function which is one on that smaller interval and zero or say the bigger interval. Huh. Well, let us draw another picture. So as before, this, but now you want the value to be 1 here on this interval. So take 1 like this, constant 1 on this. And then you can do anything here, join this. So you get a trapezium now, it's a trapezoidal function. So this is about continuous functions. What about smooth functions? For smooth functions, you have to eliminate these corners there. So this, of course, is easily done. Instead of a triangle like this, you can draw something of that kind. And again, here you have to eliminate this corner. So instead of joining like that, you have to touch the axis before this point smoothly and then come like that. You can also smoothen this. So you have to smoothen at <coughs> all the four corners now. So, you can do this for any interval, however small or however big it is, right? So, in fact, you can do this for any compact sets. Take a bigger compact set, take a co smaller compact set, can find a smooth function which is 1 on that compact set and 0 outside the bigger compact set. It's not difficult, but I will not go into that right now. Okay. So, so, I mean, the whole point is to say that there are, you can easily construct lots of such functions. So, in fact, I just state what you can do. So, given 
compact sets K and C in R with K contained in C. There is a C infinity function on R, F on R, such that F is equal to 1 on K and support F is contained in C. That is F is 0 outside C. That's what this means. So there are lots and lots of uh, functions which vanish uh, outside a compact set and are infinitely differentiable. In the case of R, is a dense subspace of uh, many function spaces on LP, for example. <laughs> CC infinity R is dense in LP, LPR, have you heard of LPR? LP spaces? Have you done your measure theory course? Huh? Doing now. Okay. So all, uh, space of all functions, measurable functions and R, which are integrable with respect to the Lebesgue measure. Uh, LP means? M is a Lebesgue measure on R. So LP is, it's, uh, it's a, what is called a Banach space, uh, one of the most important examples of Banach spaces. C0R is all continuous functions on R which vanish at infinity, which go to zero at minus infinity and zero. At mod x goes to infinity, f of x goes to zero. All continuous functions. Vanishing at infinity. Vanishing at at infinity limit, right? Limit f x as mod x goes to infinity is zero. So, I mean, just to impress you that this is a large space, that's all. Okay. Analytic function which vanishes on a set with a limit point is zero. Whereas here you can have functions vanishing on as large a compact set as you want, but still. So you can restate this uh, if you want in algebraic terms about the Suppose omega is connected. H omega is, or A omega if you want, all holomorphic functions. H for holomorphic. Okay, you can write A omega if you want, doesn't matter. So functions which are analytic on a given domain, omega. <coughs> of course, if f and g are analytic, so is f plus g, so is uh, scalar times f, so this is a vector space over c, not just that, but it's always an algebra. If f and g are analytic, so is fg, product, point-wise product, right? The derivative of fg is f prime g plus fg prime, the usual. So, so this is, uh, this is an algebra, it's a vector space and it's also a ring, right? Okay. 
complex algebra. If you, if you haven't come across the term algebra, hmm? no, you haven't. We have. Fine. So essentially, roughly speaking, it's a vector space and also a ring, and which of course is all the operations are suitably connected. Okay, so it's a ring, basically. Look at that as a ring right now. Forget the linear structure. So what kind of ring is this? Of course, it's a commutative ring, actually. Does it have any zero divisors? You have talked of zero divisors? Suppose you have two functions, f and g, so that fg is the zero function. What can you conclude from whatever we have said earlier about the zeros of an analytic function? Fg is zero means what? Fz into gz is zero for every z in the domain. So which means at every point, either this is zero or that is zero. Okay. So, but what about the set where this is zero? If f is not the zero function, this is a set which has no limit point, right? Similarly for g, right? So let us say a set of zeros of uh, f is a, and the set of zeros of g is b. If neither f nor g is the zero function, a is a discrete set, b is also a discrete set. So if you take them together, you don't, of course, exhaust the whole of omega, right? A union B is not the whole of omega, because both A and B are discrete sets, countable, even <laughs> look at the cardinality. A is countable, B is countable, A union B is countable, so it's not the whole of omega. But in any case, so, so what is the conclusion? If neither f nor g is a zero function, fg cannot be the zero function. Or put another way, if fg is zero, at least one of them has to be the zero function. Which means, in ring theoretic terms, what does it say? h omega is an integral domain. Right? Once you have an integral domain, you have what is called the quotient field, field of quotients. So, so what is that in this case? Okay, first of all, let's go back to polynomials. Hmm. The ring of polynomials is an integral domain, right? Yes or no? Product of two polynomials cannot be zero unless one of them is zero. So ring of polynomials in the integral domain. So what is the field of quotients in that case? Do you know how you just, how do you generally construct, starting with, uh, with an integral domain, how do you construct the field of quotients? Informally, what you do is, you look at A by B, whatever it means, where B is non-zero, right? Formally, of course, you have to do this, that, and so on. Essentially, what you are doing is this. Quotient of two polynomials is what you are going to look at. And you want to get the field of quotients of the ring of polynomials. So, quotient of two polynomials, denominator non-zero. What is it? Just the ring of uh, the set of uh, rational functions. That's, what how, that's how we define a rational function. A rational function is a function of the form p by q, where p and q are polynomial, and q is not the zero polynomial. 
So the field of quotients of the ring of polynomials is the field of rational functions. The set of rational functions, the rational fun functions form a field. Of course, rational functions are not analytic functions, right? Where the denominator polynomial is zero, you have problems. Okay, so they have uh, some singularities at the zeros of the denominator. So there are what are called poles. We'll come to that. Mm -hmm. So except where the denominator is zero, a rational function is analytic everywhere. So the only points where a rational function is not analytic is the points where the denominator is zero. Okay, so uh, those points uh, are what are called poles of the function. We will come to them uh, soon. So a rational function has, uh, is, is analytic except possibly for poles, a finite number of poles in this case. So if you start with uh, holomorphic functions on omega, so again, informally, we are going to look at, when you want to form field of quotients, you are going to look at functions of the form f by g, where g is also analytic, but not the zero function, but it can have some zeros. So except at the points where g is zero, f by g is going to be analytic. At the points where g is going to be zero, again, this uh, functions have poles. So such functions are called meromorphic functions. I'm not going to write down now because we have not defined what poles are so far. So once we define what poles are, meromorphic functions are uh, functions which are analytic except possibly for some poles. So field of quotients of which omega functions which are, we have not defined this term, we will soon define which are meromorphic. We will define meromorphic function a little later, okay, once we define poles. So in particular, the, when you take omega equal to the whole plane, so what do you get in this case? Entire functions, functions which are analytic in the whole plane, entire functions. So they form a, an integral domain in the field of quotients is uh, instead of all functions which are meromorphic in the whole plane. Like uh, tan z, for example. Sin z, cos z, both are analytic, our entire functions Right, and cos z is zero at uh, various points. So this is uh, a meromorphic function, the whole plane. And we'll come back to all this when we define meromorphic functions. Okay, so the, anyway, the important point to remember is uh, that the set of zeros is isolated for any analytic function, okay? And uh, the identity theorem, if, uh, <laughs> A function vanishes on a set with a limit point, it must be identically zero, an analytic function.
a non-constant analytic function in a domain has no local maximum. Of course, complex valued, so you have to put the modulus to talk of maximum. So if f is a non-constant analytic function in a domain then modulus fz has no local maximum so what do you mean by local maximum a neighborhood local generally refers to what happens in neighborhood or stated another way if an analytic function has a local maximum at some point, then the function must be a constant. That's what this is. Okay. So suppose So in some disk around Z0, mod F0 is a maximum. Of course, the disk must lie inside omega and so on, right? Then we must conclude that F is a constant or F Z equal to F of Z0. Okay, let's consider two cases. Suppose f of z naught is zero. Then what happens? This tells you that f z naught f z is zero on the disk. Okay. I call this disk as D, let's say. For all Z and D. So, but if the function is zero on a disk, the identity theorem tells you that it must be zero the whole domain. Right? Consider the case where f z naught is not zero. So in this case, you have the mean value property. So this is one over two pi, zero to two pi f of z naught plus r e power i t dt, right? 
So this is just a rewriting of the Cauchy integral formula on the circle. So f z naught is non-zero by assumption. So we look at uh, mode f z naught by f z naught, the sigma function. So call this something. This makes sense because f of z naught is non-zero. So mod z f z naught, therefore, is lambda times f of z naught, lambda times this integral. The left side is modulus of something, in particular it is real. So this whole thing is real. So the same as the real part of this. So you can take the real part inside. Same as the real part because the left hand side is real. So the right hand side is real. So same as the real part. Taking the modulus also inside the integral, mod f z naught, same as 1 by 2 pi 0 to 2 pi mod f z naught dt. Is equal to 0, right? I'm just taking this to the other side and this is same as the integral of that, the constant, so because of the 1 by 2 pi there. What can you say about the integrand there, the function that you are integrating, the function of t? What is the relation between this and that? Real part of w is less than or equal to modulus w. So the real part of this is less than or equal to modulus of that. But what is modulus of that? What about lambda? Lambda is this. So mod lambda is 1. OK? So modulus goes there. So you just get modulus of this. So anyway, so in any case, therefore, remember this is your z, z naught plus r e power i t, right? So modulus of f z is less than or equal to modulus of f z naught by assumption. So which means that this function inside the integral is non-negative. 
right so absolute value of this is less than or equal to this so the whole thing is non negative Mm, of course obviously continuous okay as a function of t so when is the integral of a non negative continuous function zero ordinary riemann integral integral of non negative function is always greater than or equal to zero f is greater than or equal to zero integral f is greater than or equal to zero when is it zero integral if the function is continuous and the integral is uh, zero the function must be zero right therefore because the integral is zero that's what we have here so what is the conclusion from that real part of something is equal to mod fz not right let's write f of z right z not plus r e power t is f of z what is lambda lambda is this fz not mod fz not over fz not hmm does this imply so if you conclude that what happens fz the constant on whole of the circle and therefore again by identity theorem the constant everywhere in the domain fz equal to fz not for all z in omega so this tells you of course for all z in the circle there mm, did we give some name there for the circle circle what our circle that circle of radius r with center z not and therefore by the identity theorem so the same thing so that i am going to leave you to verify so that's what we want to say so if if the function has a local maximum it must be a constant that's all we want to say so another exercise for you to try is to try to derive the fundamental theorem of algebra from the maximum modulus theorem
subdomain inside omega say for example a disk right if you take a disk inside omega the closed disk is a compact set okay and uh, mod f of z is a continuous function therefore it will have a maximum on the closed disk so so what does the maximum modulus theorem say the maximum cannot be attained in inside the circle it has to be on the boundary of the circle right so if compact okay we know that on a compact set the maximum has to be attained some, somewhere but what the maximum modulus theorem says is that it cannot be inside the in the interior of the set but it can be only on the boundary of the set this is a boundary of k of course this is in case f is not constant so if it is a constant of course If it's, a, if it's a constant, it's same everywhere, whether boundary or interior, or anything. So, so we can probably as well prove Schwarz lemma now. Schwarz was a student of Weierstrass, Berlin. Suppose f is analytic in the unit disk right so generally i had been using d for a disk but for the unit disk i'll use this special d mm. mod z less than 1 but disk of radius 1 with center at the origin and mod f z is less than or equal to 1 for all z then the conclusion is
so this is a rotation equality holds in the case only in the case of a rotation you know, it is rotation through an angle alpha right this is rotation through an angle alpha z goes to e to the i alpha times z so define oh that's the crucial thing f0 is 0 Or okay, let's say f dash zero. Then what can you say about G? G is analytic D. What else you know can say about G? just want to apply the maximum modulus theorem to G. That's all. So what do you get if you do that? On the boundary, what can you say about G? That is for mod Z equal to 1. You are given mod f is less than or equal to 1, right? So you are going to get mod gz is less than or equal to 1 over mod z, right? But on the boundary, mod z is 1, so mod gz is going to be less than or equal to 1, right? But the maximum is on the boundary, by the maximum modulus theorem. So if it's less than or equal to something on the boundary, then it has to be less than or equal to that thing on the interior also, right? Therefore, mod g z is less than or equal to one in d, in the whole of the interior also, which means modulus of this is less than or equal to one, which means Right? That's all. What about the second statement? What is f prime zero by definition? F zero, I mean f z minus f zero divided by z limit of that. But f zero is zero by hypothesis. So f prime zero is nothing but limit of f z by z. Okay? We already concluded that fz is modulus of fz by z is less than or equal to 1. Therefore, in the limit also it is going to be less than or equal to 1. Right? So, this immediately gives you this on taking limits.
what about this condition for equality when do you get equality so that means at any point inside it's less than or equal to that maximum but when is it equal to that maximum only when the function is a constant right so equality holds if and only if gz over z i mean gz that is gz which is fz over z is a constant okay which means a constant of modulus 1 because the maximum is 1 okay so that means fz over z is some e to the i alpha for some real alpha right equality holds in either of these thing so equality holds if and only if some yeah so we will we'll stop now